this week. Could you answer the questions of others that might come to you and challenge you about such a position? Because you may be convinced for yourself and happy in that position, but not sure that you could necessarily answer others, well, this week is for you. And let me say, if you are here and you're either new to us or just for whatever reason you have, you read and prefer a different English version of the Bible, a different translation, that, that's cool, that's truly okay, but my question for you would be, would you be willing to consider the material that will be presented this week with an open mind? You know, truth is a funny thing, and we should never be afraid of it, right? Jesus Christ said in John 8, 32 that we can know the truth, right? We'll know it, and when we do, what's going to happen? It'll make us free. And so, we just want you to be open. We want you to consider. We want you to study. We want you to be ready and willing to do the work. So this week, there is going to be, if you'll follow all the sessions, there is going to be a lot of technical information presented. But let me just tell you at the beginning, relax. You don't need to be a scholar of ancient languages that nobody speaks anymore in order to understand the material that will be presented. But you do need to decide that you're going to learn this information for yourself. Uh, don't be one of those people who just says, I'm just going to go along with the crowd. Uh, let me just warn you up front. Most people won't bother to do the work. But you can. You can decide that you're going to do the work. Um, you know, it is kind of a sad phenomenon these days that there are many, many former pastors that were on staffs of King James Bible believing churches that at one time would have even signed a document saying, I believe the very things I just said. But for whatever reason, they move on to some other place and they have gotten a, here's the key word, job at a new church that doesn't necessarily believe that anymore and they just decided I'm going to pitch this pos position and this conviction because, well, I'm drawing my salary from somewhere else now. Uh, you know, that's a real problem. That's a real problem in character, and it's a real problem in your faith. In this one issue, can I encourage you today, do the work. Do the work. Have some courage and take a stand, because it actually does matter that much. All right, we're going to get into our study. Let me just take a second and pray and ask God to guide every word that we will hear today. Lord Jesus I do pray that you would take your holy word, that you would open it, that your spirit would enlighten it to our hearts, that we would see exactly what you would have us to see. Lord, I know there is a lot of material to cover today, tonight, and every day for the next three days. But Lord, your spirit can teach us everything that we need. And each of us are at different places, and each of us need whatever it is we need. And my prayer, Lord, is that you will give to each and every one exactly what they need to hear so that they can make an informed decision. We do love you, and we are so thankful for the truth, and we are thankful for the freedom that it brings us. We pray that you would be honored in this. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay, well, we're going to address our study today with two simple and, if I may say, yet profound questions. And the first is this, did God really preserve his word for us today? So this is the theme, this is the stated theme for the entire week, the preservation of the Scriptures. And I want to start by just doing a little bit of groundwork of things that you may already be aware of. And the first point is this, inspiration. Uh, we would define inspiration as the act of God using men to give His Word. And anybody who would claim to know Jesus as their Savior would be okay with that. Everybody would say, absolutely, inspiration is God giving His Word through men. But the thing I want you to understand scripturally is that this, this point of inspiration, it is spoken, not written. As we see in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 where it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now this prophecy in 2 Peter refers to the prophecy of the scripture. But the idea is, is that when God gave it, the holy men spake they preached it and then ultimately somebody wrote it down but the inspiration deals with this idea of speaking in fact technically technically we're going to get technical off and on this week right scripture is not inspired 
say, wow, I don't know, this sounds weird. Okay, Scripture technically, notice in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, where it says, all Scripture is keywords given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Right? The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished on all good works. And so this idea that all Scripture is not necessarily directly inspired, it is given by inspiration. In other words, God inspired men to speak His truth, and then it is given through that inspiration of the spoken word to be written. Now, interestingly enough, that particular rendering of 2 Timothy 3.16, that it is given by inspiration, you will find only in your King James Bible. Because everybody else will write it a little different way to make you think that the scriptures are actually preserved. I have no beef with the scriptures. The point is you just technically need to see the process that God goes through. For example, if you took the time and looked up churches and their statement of faith on their websites or whatever the case might be, you would find a common statement of faith throughout many, many churches that would read something like this. We believe that the scriptures are inspired by God and perfect and without error in the original manuscripts. And most people would just read past that and say, well, of course, of course they're perfect in the original manuscripts, but that's not really the issue. That may sound fine. The issue is, what about today? What about what we have today? Is what I hold in my hands just close enough? I mean, think about it. Do you really think that God inspired His Word and that it was perfect when it was originally penned And that somehow he just let it be corrupted by sloppy, scribal errors. Because if you really push guys that think that it was only perfect in the originals to their logical conclusion, they'll ultimately have to admit that, that, well, you know, I mean, men make mistakes. We're doing the best we can. Okay, well, that only means that you don't actually believe that what you have is perfect. Well, the next point with that then is preservation. And we will define preservation this way, the act of God using men to keep his word pure. Okay, and everybody might think that they're okay with that, but not really. (laughs) Here's the way that you can remember it. Inspiration is speaking. Preservation is writing. Uh, You ever play the telephone game? You ever talk into somebody's ear and you say something and they say something to somebody else and they say something to somebody else? How do you ever know if the last guy said, the last guy never says what the first guy said, right? And if all it was was spoken and if it was never written down, right, then we're in trouble because inspiration without preservation is useless. It's, it, it makes the Word of God nothing more than a fable. It, it's nothing more than oral tradition, Once upon a time in a land far, far away, God spoke to man. And they say that he said some wonderful things, but we just don't have a reliable record of it anymore. You know what it is? It's theistic evolution. That's what it is. God caused the big bang of inspiring men to speak his word, but then he left it up to them so that the word might evolve over the centuries. Human nature took its course, and, well, now we have hundreds and hundreds of Bibles, which, by the way, say various different things in some key places. Well, that all sounds good, but can you prove it? Well, we think we can. That's why we're here. So let's get into some Bible study. The Promise of Preservation, Psalms chapter 12. This is the place we will be camping for some time. Psalms chapter 12, let me read for you verses 6 and 7, where it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, Interestingly, again, you will find that that set of verses, specifically verse number 7, is only preserved written that way for you in a King James Bible. We're going to get into that in just a second. I find it odd that these key verses find themselves being altered just a little in these other versions that supposedly are all the same. Uh, I find it odd that in 2 Timothy 2.15, the King James Bible is the only Bible that tells you that you are to study the Bible. Why do no other versions of the Bible tell you that you're supposed to study the Bible? 
This is the only verse in all of the Bible that gives a clear and direct promise that God will preserve his, not just His Word, but His words, each and every one of them, for us forever. So it's no surprise that those that have changed the words might not want that verse to read that way, right? And what they will argue is, is that when it says that He will preserve them from this generation forever, that it's not referring to the words of the Lord in verse 6, but they're going to go back to verse 5 and say it's referring to the poor and the needy. We're going to get into that in just a second. The question is, who got it right? That's really the issue, and it's only fair that we take the time to look at it accurately. So the way that we're going to study this, our first point is by looking at context. You always start with context right? That is the key to Bible study. Everybody knows that. We want to see the overall message of Psalms 12. There's only eight verses. Let me go back to the beginning and just read all of them. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said with our tongue, Will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted." So we see in verse number one that we have these godly and faithful men that cease to be found very often, and that typically is going to happen when verse number eight is the case, when the wicked and the vile men are in charge. But that is really not the context of Psalms chapter 12. I want you to notice as you just glance down all those verses in verses two through seven, look at all these different words that are used, speak, lips, lips. Tongue, speaketh, said, tongue, lips, saith, puffeth, which literally means to speak. So the real context of the message of Psalms chapter 12 is in your notes, God's words are superior to men's words. That's really the issue, and the result of that is to be able to identify and differentiate which guys are the vile and wicked guys, speaking their own words, and which guys are the guys that stand for the Lord, the godly and the faithful people, because they speak the godly and faithful words, right? You can identify who's who by what they say. And so God is responding to their wickedness. At the end of verse 4, they're like, who's, gonna, who's the Lord? We'll say whatever we want to say. They are focused on their own words and their own will. And the Lord says, oh yeah, well in verse 5, I'm going to rise up. I'm going to protect the oppressed from the wicked. And, and I'm going to let you know what the truth of this situation really is. And so verse 6, the words of the Lord, because the Lord just said something. So he emphasizes that the words, his words, they're not like the words of vile men. They're pure words. In fact, they're so pure, they're likened unto silver that is purified seven times. And a lot can be made of the seven times, and I suspect you'll be hearing more about that as this week goes on. But let me just make this very simple application. Purified seven times is completely purified. In other words, seven is the number of completion in the Scriptures. When it's purified seven times, it's done. And that's the point that he's trying to make. So it says God will keep them, his words, and God, this is a promise, will preserve them, his words, forever. In other words, he will do exactly what he said he will do. He will judge the wicked and he will protect the oppressed. And we know that because he said it. And he said it with words that will never change. He will preserve what he says forever. So the context gives us the understanding of what's being said here. The second thing is the composition. The composition. Now, this is where the real debate comes in. It's the debate over Hebrew grammar. So, warning, warning, technical info ahead. (laughs) Fasten your seatbelts. Put your trays in the upright and locked position. I mean, you have to get ready for this one, okay? A little technical here. Hang on. 
So the argument is, here's the argument. They who would discount the simple truth of verses 6 and 7, they say that God actually is not promising to preserve His words, right, but the people. And they say that because in the analysis of the Hebrew grammar, the second them, thou shalt preserve them, okay, the second them, now you're going to hang with me, some of our English teachers are just going to have the best day of their life right now, but the rest of us are like, okay, whatever. Okay, so the second them in the Hebrew language, that personal pronoun, it is a masculine, third person singular personal pronoun. We're just getting started. Hang on. Whereas them refers to a bunch of people, third person plural, right? So it's not third person singular, it's third person plural in the English. They say you blew it, it should be singular. That's the idea. And the idea is this, because the rule in Hebrew is that the personal pronouns have to match the antecedent, the thing to which they're referring, in number and in gender. Okay, now English doesn't have gender in common nouns. Okay, is this podium masculine or feminine? In English, it doesn't differentiate. In many, many other languages, it does. So the, the personal pronoun would have to agree with the thing it's referring to in gender as well as in number, singular or plural. So they would say that it's an error to ascribe preserve them to the words because it shouldn't be them, it should be something singular. That's the idea. But with that logic, interestingly, right, because you can always spot a guy who's kind of lying. According to Hebrew grammar, let me tell you what it can't be translated as. It can't be translated the way that almost every other English Bible on the market translates it, and it translates it as us. Thou shalt preserve us. Go and check. Now, us is not only plural and not matching the number. Us is not even third person. Us includes me, which means it's first person plural. Now, some of you are like, get past the grammar and let's get to the Bible. <laughs> this is the argument they make. This is, you have to have this info. This is a Bible college uh, class. Okay, so this is a very important point, okay? So in other words, based on just that logic alone, out go all English translations, except we're going to argue the King James Version. And one other English version that I'm aware of anyways, the New American Standard Bible, which chooses to translate third-person singular pronoun, not as them, but as him, because that would be the third-person masculine singular pronoun, him. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve him, not them. That's what they would argue, and that's what the New American Standard puts in. You might be thinking, oh, okay, great, that's probably what it should be then. Uh, well, let me give you another fact. This is in your notes. All grammar rules have exceptions especially in poetry, okay? Psalms are poetry. They're not unbreakable rules. They're guidelines. And I want you to understand that if you were to have uh, a copy, I have a copy of the original 1611 uh, authorized King James Version when it came out in that year, and if you were to read Psalms 12 in the original penning of the 1611 that came out, uh, you will find a marginal note in the side column Next to verse number 7, by the word them. And the marginal note in the original KJV of 1611 would say, in quotes, him slash every one of them. Every one of them. Now, to help you to understand that, let me just give you an English equivalent. This will help you. The English equivalent would be the English word, think of the word everyone. Everyone. Everyone is a word that is grammatically singular. What does that mean? We would say, everyone is here. We wouldn't say, everyone are here. I mean, I'm not sure exactly where you'd have to grow up if you said, everyone are here, but we would not say, <laughs> everyone are here. We would say, everyone is here. It's grammatically singular. However, the pronoun associated with it is not singular, it's plural. Because we would say, everyone is here, they are here. For everyone, we wouldn't say he, we would say they, right? So it has grammatical singularity, but the pronoun is plural. And the idea would be each and every one 
of a group, each and every one singularly within the context of a group. So we have words like that, and Hebrew has words like that, okay, and it, that's how it ties in. So, hey, let me just say this to the New American Standard Bible uh, proponents, that if it should be translated in English as him and not them, let me just ask this question, what then is the proper English antecedent vocab, the word we're referring to, in Psalms 12? If it's singular, where is the singular masculine subject that it refers to? Well, you can't go back to verse 5 with the poor and the needy because those are plural. You'd have to go all the way back to verse number 1 where it says the godly man. The godly man. And that is so far removed from a personal pronoun, no self-respecting English grammarian would allow that. Uh, Him, interestingly, in verse 5 in your King James Bible is written in italics. Notice that in verse 5 it says, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. But the King James translators are so honest that when a word didn't even exist in Hebrew and they needed to add it for clarity, they added it using italics so you would know. That's honest translation. And so that him in verse 5 doesn't even exist in the Hebrew. So if you're going to go to the Hebrew grammar to defend it, how y'all doing? Y'all hanging in there? We doing okay? I'm trying to move this thing through, but keep you on track, right? So the idea is this. Thank you. I just want to show how a singular pronoun can be associated with a plural antecedent. I'm just telling you, this is the kind of argument, this is the kind of, listen, you think you're confused. This is the mess you get into when you start having bad hermeneutics, when you have bad Bible study practices. So let's land the plane. Y'all ready? Okay, a couple of options to consider what exactly should we understand from this. Well, here's one option. Uh, Some people would like to say that God is saying that He will preserve both the people of verse 5 and the words of verse 6. And, you know, it's fair to consider that. I mean, what are the only two things that last forever anyway? It's the souls of men and the Word of God. Those are the only two things. And in a sense, you could say that the Lord preserves the souls of men forever and the Lord preserves His words forever. Okay, but I don't actually think that that's the intended understanding here. And the reason I don't think that is because, well, if you just look, the poor and the needy of verse 5 of the days and times of King David, well, they weren't really preserved all that well, were they? I mean, you'd have to extrapolate that into some spiritual salvation, which is nowhere near the context of Psalms chapter 12, okay? They're just talking about oppressed people. Listen, generally speaking, the Jews in general, they weren't preserved all that well, were they? Uh, The nation of Israel as a nation, they, they really weren't preserved all that well, were they? So I think that that's kind of a hard stretch to say that's what he intended. Rather, I would offer for you that we just believe what we have in our King James Bible. And that actually the masculine third person singular pronoun, okay, still refers to the words of God, or may we just say the word of God, now used singularly, still covering this plurality. In other words, you could consider it this way. With liberty, allow me to to offer this. Thou shalt keep them all, the words, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve each and every one of them from this generation forever. Listen, don't kid yourself. The King James Bible translators certainly understood the issues of Hebrew grammar. We know that because of their marginal note, right? They also understood that this is poetry. And they chose to represent this in a way with the same English pronoun, them, just so that they could keep the focus where the focus belongs, on the words of the Lord, or the word of the Lord, if you prefer to lean towards that singular second them. Okay, enough of that. Next point. For clarity's sake, let me give you another very easy-to-grasp way to understand this. Clarity. 
The word keep and the word preserve in your English Bible are synonyms. They are synonyms all throughout the Scriptures. These two words are used interchangeably. The word that is translated keep is often translated preserve and vice versa. And they are used interchangeably because they mean the same thing. That's why. In other words, verse 7, without affecting one bit of understanding, could read this way. Verse 7 could read, Thou shalt preserve them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That would have the exact same meaning as is written. And so if the debate then is only over the second them in the statement, in the sentence, well, you've already negated the opportunity to argue because you agree that the first them should be there. And keep means preserve, and preserve means keep. And he could have just repeated the word twice, but again, this is poetry, and that just wouldn't be kosher. And if you wanted to make it sound lovely, and if you want to make it flow, and if you, they just chose to use two synonyms to make it sound right. It's poetic style. It's their privilege to be able to do that. That's how it came out. It makes perfect sense from a clarity standpoint. And the last thing I want to point out, and we'll mention this briefly and then we'll move on, but it will have application throughout this week, uh, is to look at the compass. In other words, the direction of this study. Uh, outside in, y'all, is always the wrong direction for Bible interpretation. Uh, if you want to understand your Bibles, if you want to study how to study the Bible, if you want God to speak to you and you want to understand what He has to say, you always start where we started, with context. You never start with foreign ancient languages to try and extrapolate and determine what you think God gave you is right or wrong. Going from the outside in is the wrong direction. Just study the context of what He gave you and how He gave it to you. I mean, at the end of the day, do you believe that God's Word is self-defining? I do. Do you believe that when God gave us His Word, He gave it in such a miraculous way that it's its own dictionary? Yes, it is. It absolutely is. And it gives us all the understanding that we need. This actually, this outside-in debate, inside out or outside in, this is the actual issue that people have trouble with over the entire translation debate. In other words, do we determine what the Bible says based on external information, ancient language grammar studies, or based on internal information contained in the text of the Scripture. This really is the issue. And so, all of this, you know, gyrating we've gone through and all this stuff that I've laid out for you so far in Psalms 12, you know what? You know what it all boils down to? And I'm kind of a bottom line kind of guy. What it boils down to is this. Jeff has his argument about grammar and all this stuff and other really smart guys have a really good argument about why Jeff's wrong or whatever. At the end of the day, you know what you're left with? You're left with one simple question, and this is in your notes. Do you believe that God providentially preserved his words for us to have today? In other words, you are either going to place your faith in the fact that God did supernaturally and providentially preserve the exact words for you to have, or you're going to place your faith in the fact that he did not. That's what it really has to do with. That's all it is. Do you really believe that Psalms 12 says what it says that it says? Or do you think that you're smarter than that and it doesn't really mean to say what it says, but it means something else? Well, if you would say, no, I don't think that's what it means, well, the good news for you is you're in the majority. <laughs> I mean, if that's worth anything to you. Uh, the majority of recognized scholarship would say, no, no, absolutely not. We don't believe that he preserved the exact words for us to have in English. Of course not. That's what they would say. And by the way, therefore, all of the other Bible translations that come from them are changed. That shouldn't surprise you. But those of you who are Bible students, this ought to wave a red flag in your mind. I mean, this ought to ring a bell for you. you. You ought to be recognizing you're in dangerous ground because you know where this road takes you, don't you? It leads to something that the Bible calls Nicolaitanism. Nicolaitanism is setting up a priest class of theologians 
over the common man. Like the Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. It sends you back to a day and a time where an elite class of minority of people are the ones who are privileged enough to have God's, we have God's words, only now it's no longer necessarily black robe priests and candles. Now you're going to somebody who has multiple earned degrees after their name, and they will say, because we have studied the ancient languages, if you'll just come to us, simpleton, we will tell you exactly what God says. Is that really any different than the Dark Ages? I mean, this is where it's sending you. If you don't learn the ancient languages, you can't really know what God says to mankind. Do you really think that that is the message that Jesus Christ came and gave his life so that you would know? I don't. You know what the irony of that position is in my mind? The irony of that position is this, that those who complain about King James onlyism as though that's some cultish position, they've developed scholarship onlyism. Uh, they think that it's weird that you would have one and all. You mean to tell me that I've got to go to only one English Bible to really get the goods on exactly what God wants for me? Well, let me ask you this, sir. Do you really mean to tell me that we have to come to you? Are you telling me i got to go to the Bible colleges to get it? I mean, where exactly would you expect us to go? Now, the answer of a Bible believer to the question, do you believe God providentially preserved his words, is yes, of course. And if that's true of you, you may be in the minority, but we're all in it with you. We're all in it with you. That is the proper way to approach the study of Bible versions and translations. By faith. By faith. And that leads us to our second point and our second simple, yet, in my humble opinion, profound question. Will you simply believe what God said? Will you simply believe what God said? And that seems like it's an easy question to answer, but you'd be amazed at how many people won't. Good, nicely dressed, well-spoken church folks, and they just won't simply believe what God said. I'm going to remind you of a verse of Scripture. It's one of my all-time favorites. God reminds me of it regularly. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6, where it says, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, we would say, as Bible believers, that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Is it? Is the Bible itself sufficiently the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. In other words, that means that we have to defer our opinions and our scholarship and anything at all. We have to defer all of that to the Bible's authority about every single subject that the Bible speaks about. That's what it means. That's what we have to do. And we do that, by the way, by faith. This is a position of faith. And such a faith, by the way, that God says, man, thank you, finally. Somebody will just believe what I said. How many of you are parents and sometimes you struggle with the kids always listening and believing what you say and then if they would just listen and believe and obey, man, you're just like, man, let's go to the creamery. Let's do something nice for you. I mean, you're listening finally. This is awesome. Uh, that's what the Lord's thinking about this thing. It pleases Him. I don't know about you, but that's a good position to be in. Amen? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that know ancient languages. No, that's not what it says. It officially worketh in all the people that were there when it was originally penned. That's not what it says. If you will believe it, it will work effectively in your life. The Word of God, this is so simple and so profound, is not the Word of men. 
It is the Word of God. He did not just inspire the originals and leave it to men to corrupt. It's His Word, and that Word has power. But only when you believe it. Only when you believe it. So we have developed a fellowship of like-minded churches, and we've given it a name, the Living Faith Fellowship of churches. And as a fellowship of churches, we agree about a lot of things, but it's all based on one thing. And the one thing that we agree on, which establishes all the other things that we agree on, is this fact that we will pursue the subject of the preservation of the Scriptures by faith. By faith. And before we dig into that, and we're going to do that in just a minute, can I just remind you that this is something that everybody does? by the way, in many other areas of the Scripture. Take, for example, creation. Um, Why do we believe that God created the world in six 24-hour days? Well, because He said it. Uh, Well, I don't know. I know scientists, and we've done this research in the Creation Science Institute, and there's many fine people who have presented actual scientific evidence in the defense of the creation account. Sure, and there's a lot of really smart scientists who would try and present evidence to the contrary. At the end of the day, why do you believe that God created everything fully mature, right? What came? I'm going to solve for you the question of the chicken and the egg, right? <laughs> everything is created fully mature that reproduces after its kind, so it's for sure the chicken, right? Congratulations, you got that for free. <laughs> why do we believe that? We believe that because, not because we're so smart, not because we investigate all the science. Do that too. That's fine. It's because God said it. We take it as a position of faith. Uh, What about the flood of Noah's day? You know, that thing's debated hotly among the scientists, right? How did the Grand Canyon get here? Okay, well, we take it by faith because God said in Genesis 6 and 7 and 8 that He covered over all the world with a flood. That's what He said. And God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. And that's all you need. You know what that reveals for us? This kind of a position, by the way, is no problem for us in creation. It's no problem for us in the flood. It's no problem about the crucifixion. It's no problem about the resurrection. It's no problem for us about many things. But boy, you get to that Bible translation thing. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What does scholarship say? Whoa, what are the scientific? Whoa, what about ancient languages? Whoa. Well, I don't know. I just think that God intended for us to believe Him and all the things that He said. So the next very important point is the importance of internal evidence. Internal evidence, evidence from inside the Bible. So you'll remember the outside-in method, that's the wrong direction, right? So the most convincing information about the Bible translation debate is not external to the Bible. It's internal to the Bible. In other words, what did God say in His Word about His Word? What did God say in His Word about His Word? And we saw that inspiration deals with speech and preservation deals with writing and Scripture is written by man and that's actually where we get the word manuscript, right? Men were used in writing it out, okay? But what does actually God say? Well, He says a lot of things, and boy, hi, boy, we're just, uh, well, I'm just going to rapid fire these things out for you, okay? But you got the references. Uh, First off, God's words are complete. We've kind of been camping here already, but the idea is He has preserved every single word, right? Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? Proverbs 30 and verse 5, every word of God is pure. It's not just the general word. It's not just the general message. God's words are complete. He gave each and every one that He wants for us to have. Uh, Number two, God's words are convenient. In other words, God's words are available, right? Uh, You go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, and you find that Timothy, from the time of his childhood, knew the Holy Scriptures. He knew the Holy Scriptures. Are you telling me that Timothy had in his sock drawer the original chiseled out Ten Commandments from Moses? Is that what you're telling me? How did that make it to Timothy's house? Listen, he didn't have the originals of anything, 
Timothy had faithfully transmitted copies of God's perfectly preserved word. They were called the Holy Scriptures. Uh, But I want to draw your attention to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 10 through 14 very quickly. And just notice what God says in His word about His word. We're going to start in verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, those are going to be His words, right? Uh, To keep His commandments and His statutes, where are they? They're written in this book of the law. So they're written together in a book, and they're written in a book that apparently somebody was holding in their hand. This book of the law, right? And if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So there's a hard attitude associated with really getting it. Uh, Verse 11, for this commandment which I command thee this day, notice, it's not hidden from thee. It's not afar off. It's not hidden in a language that nobody speaks anymore. It's not hidden somewhere where you can't get it. He had made it available for everybody. Verse 12, it's not in heaven that thou should say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Uh, There's an argument out there that says, well, the Bible says God's word is settled in heaven. Yeah, it doesn't say it's preserved in heaven, though. That is a different word. Uh, It's settled in heaven because God knows exactly what he means to say, and that's why only God can give perfect translations. That's why only God can do that. But it's not in heaven. It means it's on earth, by the way, if it's not in heaven. (laughs) That's the idea, right? Uh, Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? You don't have to get on a boat and go over the sea and go to a British museum to find original copies. You don't have to do that because you have a copy. And you did all the way from the time of Moses. This is the principle that God has for his word. Verse 14 But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thine heart that thou mayest do it. Listen, God has some pretty strong things to say about his word. They're compiled. They're compiled in a book. That's our third point. We kind of saw that already, Revelation 22. It talks about the Word of God, right, that we're not supposed to mess with, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, that it's in a book. That's the book of the law. It's the book of His Word, right? They're put together in a book. They're compiled. It's in a place where, where you can handle it. You can touch it. You can see it. You can have it. It's not far off. We've kind of seen this already. But you know what else God says about His Word? You know what else what he says that we need to be aware of? And this is a very important part of this discussion, and it will be a very important part of the information that you will be given in the morning sessions as well this week, that God's words will be corrupted. Uh, God warns us that there will be those out there who will actually do that. Falsifications and counterfeits will exist. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, Paul says, we're not like some of these guys. Some of those guys are out there corrupting God's word. So God's trying to warn you. He's saying, hey, watch it. There's going to be people out there who will corrupt his word. You can glance down into 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 2, and he says, some guys are are going to take the word of God and they're going to handle it deceitfully. They're going to handle it deceitfully. Don't be shocked when somebody does that. And I know you might think immediately you're going to go to your you know, least favorite TV preacher and how they twist things. Okay, that's one example. But some examples may be a little closer to home than you would have thought. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let me turn there real quick and look at it. 2 Thessalonians, this is actually really good. Chapter 2 and verse number 2. I'll just look here with you. Notice this, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. What was he trying to say to the Thessalonians who were wondering, did we miss the rapture? What happened? Did we miss it? What happened? He's saying, look, don't be troubled by letters that guys are falsifying saying that we sent them. We didn't send those letters. These are falsified copies that people are saying they attributed to Paul. Letters as from us. Listen, God's warning you. He's trying to prepare you. He said some things about his word, but he also said there's going to be guys out there. So the last thing I think you really need to get as far as our study this morning is concerned anyway, and this is number five, God commends the church that kept his word. Now, you remember back in Psalm 12, the words that are synonyms, keep is the same as preserve and preserve is the same as keep. And so we have a church, it's the church of Philadelphia and You guys know all about this, right? The seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 in Asia Minor, and they represent the seven periods of church history, and 
The Philadelphian church, Revelation 3, verses 8, 9, and 10, are praised for the fact that they are the ones who kept God's words. They are the ones. What is the time frame of the Philadelphian church period? It is from the 16th to the 19th century. If you want a Bible, you want a Bible that was translated during the Philadelphian church period. That's the one you want. Because those are the ones that God said kept slash preserved His words. That's important. Those are pieces of internal evidence. These are things that God says in His word about His word. And we accept them by faith. We accept them by faith. And then taking faith in God's word as it is given to us. Submitting ourselves to its authority, not the other way around. Not critically judging the authority of the Bible as though we place ourselves over it. Submitting ourselves to its authority. Then what we find is, by faith, we then look for, among the world of Bible translations, which one fits those criteria. And this is the conclusion that we come to. So, any time when something is kept preserved, pure from corruption, you expect that purely preserved version of something to be one. And yet the counterfeits can be many, right? There can be tens, scores, hundreds of false counterfeits. But God didn't promise to preserve 150 different versions of perfectly preserved words. He promised to preserve His Word. That's what He promised to do. And He said that there would be counterfeits. So this is what we refer to or others refer to us. It's the King James only position. And let me just say this to you. Because the fact that a group of believers are exclusive in their selection of a particular version of Scripture... That shouldn't be considered to be weird. It should be considered to be proper because we're just searching for the one place God preserved it. And by comparing things with themselves and with each other, what you'll find is is that, well, things that are different aren't the same. (laughs) I mean, you got to go to school for this stuff. So the way that we phrase it is we have a faith-based view of the preservation of the Scriptures. Let's dig into that a little bit because ever since this phrase was coined, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I want to say it's Pastor Alan Shelby that, that coined it, and uh, if not, somebody else may be as smart as him. It's hard to find a guy as smart as him. A faith-based view is the thing that I want to help you to understand. And so, what I've attached in your notes, and one of the reasons why your notes are so long today, is I wanted to give you a printed copy of this statement that has been prepared to quell any doubts, to answer any question about what exactly does that mean. So, this is a position statement that was drafted for us by Dr. Billy V. Bartlett. This is Pastor Brett Bartlett's father on behalf of our Fellowship of Churches. And I know you can read, but let's read it together. A reasonable spectrum of fellowship concerning the English Bible. Since its inception, the accepted nomenclature concerning the English Bible for the Living Faith Fellowship has been one of a, quote, faith-based view of preservation. We feel it's important to clarify this so there is no confusion about what it means. A faith-based view of preservation is not the position of our fellowship. It is rather our reasoning which leads us to the position that the authorized King James Bible is our absolute authority. We understand that even with people who would agree with the aforementioned sentiment, there are varying perspectives of its implications, both technically and practically. For the purposes of locking arms in our phalanx, we feel it's prudent to acknowledge that these nuances should be defined by local church pastors for the purposes of their respective assemblies. As to not break faith with these good men and this fitting compact, wisdom would dictate we outline the acceptable boundaries of what submits to this understanding. Here it is. At one end of the line, the farthest we could possibly stretch this position would be the agreement 
that the authorized King James Bible is God's superintended translation for English-speaking peoples without proven error. At the other end, we acknowledge that many King James advocates see it as something more. God's perfectly preserved words in the order that he desired them as a uniquely canonized manifestation in regards to any language at any time. On either end, and all those who would commit to holding a line in between, we understand that a faith-based view of preservation means we do not begin the search for God's words with naturalistic and skeptical means, working back through time and lines of manuscripts into a position on a version of the Bible, that outside-in method. Rather, we begin with faith in the Bible itself, that God, as promised, gave us the ability to carry out His command to live by every word of God in granting access to them in our language in a specific ordering of syntax in a book. For the Living Faith Fellowship, that book is the monarch of all books, the Lion of the Philadelphian Age, the authorized King James Bible. Now, some of you are going to take that home and read it a couple times. And you should. You know what that really means? It means this, and and we're almost done. Our position of faith is that the authorized King James Bible is our absolute authority. We've covered this. But the idea is just simply this. We're going from the inside out. We're not going from the outside in. But in so saying, let me just take a second to make it clear to you that while it means that, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean, lest there be any confusion, that anybody who would claim to have faith that some different English translation of the Bible, ESV, NIV, whatever their favorite, is also the perfectly preserved Word of God, that that position would be included in this doctrinal position of our fellowship. In other words, you can have faith in whatever you want, but it's the object of your faith that gives it validity. Uh, There's a lot of people who have faith that if they live a good life, they'll be in heaven when they die. But they haven't put their faith in the right object. You have to put your faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to pay for your sins. Or you're not saved. Uh, I don't care how many atheists pray for you at your funeral. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you put your faith in the right thing. And our faith has to be in the right thing. And there's a lot of people who would say, well, I have a view of faith on the preservation. It just leads me to a different conclusion. Well, that's fine. I mean, this is America. You have free choice. That is not, the, all I'm saying is that is not the position officially of the Living Faith Fellowship of Churches. Okay, now, now, to make it clear, because I, there's always going to be somebody who's wondering about this, right? You as an individual, and I mean this with all my heart for our church. I believe I could speak for everybody's churches that fellowship with us. You as an individual are welcome to read whatever Bible you want, truly. I mean, it just does not matter to me if you want to read other versions of the Scripture because you just you like the way they sound, for example. And these things will be addressed as well this week. But what we are saying is that the official church doctrinal position does not include other translations as adequate. It doesn't include other translations as adequate. It doesn't matter if they came from the Textus Receptus, if you know what that is or not. Number two, our position will not be divided by nuance. And this is also important to note as we read through this section. There are nuances of what exactly it means that we believe the King James Bible is a perfectly preserved Word of God. There's nuances where some are willing to take it a little further than others, okay? And there's room for people to disagree a little bit with that level of nuance. That's fine. So at one end, some people would say, well, of course, the authorized King James Bible is the perfect Word of God for English-speaking people without any proven error. But I mean, what about all the other languages? Um, I'm not so sure I'm willing to say they got to get an English Bible. I mean, that sounds weird. Okay, that's the position of a lot of people. On the other end, some people would say, well, listen, there's only one perfect Bible on the planet. I don't care what language it is. And it's the English KJV. Some people would say, whoa, that's a little too far for me. Okay, whatever. Within our fellowship, we can have different people who land at different... Listen, in the scope of Bible translations, a line a mile wide, we're talking about, you know, you know a centimeter apart. I mean, there's, I mean, that's what we're talking about. But let me just say this. As was stated in that... Let me just restate what was said. 
Such nuanced discussions are the privilege of local churches and their leadership. And any church in our fellowship can choose to teach a position that they're comfortable with and that this conference is not designed to address such nuances. If you're interested in those kind of conversations, grab a particular pastor or leader, have lunch with them, buy their lunch, and uh, <laughs> might be more willing to get a conversation going, and uh, let them tell you what they believe for their church, but it won't become written in stone that everybody necessarily has to agree with that, right? So the teaching won't address this level of nuance, and we won't entertain questions for this level of nuance either. In other words, we will not allow people to attempt to divide us based on minute details. It's just not wise. So the position of this church and of this fellowship is on the authority of the Holy Bible, and it is clear. The details to defend that position, well, that's what we're doing this week. That's what we're here for. So, having said all that, how you doing? Y'all doing okay? You know what the real question is at the end of all that? And this is, this is a serious deal, like before you get all packed up and ready to go. Do you care? I mean, do you care? Because a lot of people are like, okay, whatever. You're probably right. No, you're smarter than me. Not a lot of people saying that, but whatever. <laughs> um, I don't really care. In other words, here's the real question. Does it matter to you that there's only one Bible that's perfectly preserved? Um, is it important enough of a subject that you would actually take a stand on it? Well, I'm convinced for myself. I'm not going to argue with anybody. Well, we're not sending you to argue. We're asking you if you're willing to take a stand. Listen, it is human nature, right, to want to criticize, question, doubt the validity of God's Word at times, right? But really, what is the root? Why do we do that? Well, we criticize and question and doubt God's Word because we don't like what it says. I don't like what it says. I don't like when it tells me i got to clean up the sin in my life. I don't like when it tells me that I'm being proud. I don't like when it tells me that, you know, vengeance is mine, I will repay when I want to go repay. I don't like when it tells me stuff, so, you know, maybe in the Greek it doesn't say that. (laughs) You don't have to become a textual scholar. You don't have to learn ancient languages that no one speaks. You don't have to learn grammar patterns of ancient languages for sure. You just have to be willing to believe what God said to you in your language. So I included a quote that I particularly like. The ability to master foreign and ancient languages has never been a substitute for honesty and common sense. And it never will be. It never will be. Have you ever noticed that in a court of law, in a court of law there are two arguing parties, right? The prosecution and the defense. And they each compile their facts to defend their case. And the ultimate decision is made by who? It's made by a jury. And when a jury is selected in a court, in our country at least, a jury is selected of common people who are not necessarily chosen because of their expertise in criminology or the details of whatever the issue is that's being tried. The common man is chosen to sit on a panel in a jury to just simply analyze the argument and determine who's lying. That's what, if you've ever been on a jury, that's your job, figure out who's lying. And I'm here to tell you that this week, you are the jury. This week, you will be given sufficient information to be able to figure out who's lying to you, who's lying to you. You don't have to be an expert in all those things. You just have to have common sense, and you just have to have faith. And, God, and by the way, our jury system, listen, it's not flawless. It works pretty good. It works pretty good because that's how we operate. It just makes sense. Let me pray for us. It's been a lot. Let's consider these things and what God would have for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, and we love you, and we are so grateful that you did not leave us in the dark. You took us from the dark ages by giving us your word so that we could have the light that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And you did that at a time in history when it was so uniquely prepared that this Bible is the Bible that has been taken all over this planet in the greatest revivals and missionary movements of all time. 
And yes, we are privileged to be born in the country that has this as our first language. But nevertheless, above all, any of those kind of conversations, we are just thankful that you preserved your word, that what we have in our hand is certain. We have the certainty of the words of truth. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for anybody who's wrestling with that issue, for anybody who's never bothered, maybe they've never wrestled, maybe they've never thought about it, that they would find their schedule to be freed enough to be able to come and to follow. And whether they can come in person or whether they pick up these uh, sessions online, uh, I, I pray that they'll do the work. I pray that they'll research. Because at the end of the day, if we don't know what you said, if we don't understand that your words are your words and what you expect from us, we don't have a chance of obeying you. We don't even have a chance. But Lord, you didn't do that to us. You left us here with clear direction. And, and I pray that as we see it, like I know it happened in my life, like I know it has happened in hundreds of people that I've known, once we see it, our lives will never be the same. You begin to speak and to teach us things that we have never seen before. The Bible is the most amazing, exciting book ever. And that's our, 